So let's look at some integrals uh, in the complex setting involving functions with branch cuts. And everybody's favorite function with branch cuts is the logarithm function. So those will be the types of functions we'll deal with in terms of integrals. Might not always be a log function because we've based other stuff on log functions. Um, the square root function is ultimately based on a log function as well. So the plan is um, integrals, complex valued functions that involve branches of the logarithm. So they'll have to give us specific branches and just going through two or three examples. Consider C to be the semicircular path Z equals E to the I theta. It's given here in figure 44. So parameterized with respect, with respect to theta as opposed to T. It's a dummy variable, doesn't matter. We're preferably using thetas when talking angles. So uh, should be used to this. Uh, and consider the branch of the square root function, f of z equals z to the one half, is e to the one half log z, where, of course, we can't take z equal to zero because of, of the log stuff. No branch of the logarithm is defined at z equals zero. And we're choosing the argument of z to be, to be between zero and two pi. So this branch of the logarithm is not defined when the argument of z is zero or, co or coterminal with zero. So it's not defined for uh, positive real numbers. Okay, uh, which is a little bit of a concern because this contour they've given us contains the positive real number three. All right, well, this will give us, uh, we can approach it a couple of different ways. It gives us an improper integral that's undefined at the end point. Uh, you deal with that in calculus two, where you integrate uh, functions maybe that have a vertical asymptote at one endpoint, the interval of integration. So this would be similar to that, not defined at the endpoint. We'll take care of it in terms of limits, just like we would in the real setting. In fact, we'll change it into a question in the real setting. So F's not defined at three, so that comes with some technical problems. Uh, it is defined on the rest of this contour, and this will lead us to an improper integral and some limits is the way I prefer to do it. Uh, we'll talk about Brown and Churchill's approach. They do a little bit of hand waving. It's ultimately legitimate, their conclusion. Uh, but let's do it right with, with improper integrals and limits. Okay, so f of z of theta, we had uh, the f function is one half e to the one half log given the branch of the logarithm. And we had the z of theta is just three e to the i theta. So when we do f of z of theta, we'll substitute for z, the z of theta stuff. And that will produce f of z of theta equals e to the one half log. There's the z of theta stuff. Okay. Uh, this branch of the logarithm is defined in turn, as, as all branches of the logarithm are, is the natural log of the real part, real part plus i times an argument. For this branch of the logarithm, that argument is between uh, 0 and 2 pi. Uh, we see we only need to consider, concern ourselves with 0 to pi uh, over the contour. So there's nothing down here in the lower half plane, so no concerns over those angles. The inconvenient truth is, eh, the, the argument of zero is a little bit of a problem. This integrand isn't defined at that point. Okay, so with an eye on the values of theta, uh, properties of exponentials, we've developed a pretty fair body of knowledge by now. Uh, tells us we can write that as a adding inside the exponential as a product of exponential functions. The real part on the left, uh, e to the one half log three, of course, that'll just produce a square root of three out, just like it would in the real setting. Hey, it is the real setting because everything's real in this little piece. Other part, we've got uh, e to the one half i theta. Okay, e to the i theta over two. We could and we will shortly write that in terms of sines and cosines. 
Now z prime of theta, z of theta was what? 3e to the i theta. So z prime of theta, we need that for an integral. Differentiate with respect to theta, just brings an i down by the chain rule to give us z prime of theta is 3i e to the i theta. So when we integrate, we'll integrate f of z of theta, z prime of theta, exactly as in the past, except the variables theta instead of t. And theta will range from, uh, theta ranges from what? Zero to pi with that concern over that endpoint. Okay, f of z of theta, uh, here we go from the previous observation, uh, z prime of theta as observed is three i e to the i theta. Uh, let's take the three and the square root of three, bring those out front, Just let the i go with it. Then we'll have an e to the i theta over two, an e to the i theta, add exponents, when multiplying, that'll produce an e to the i three theta over two. Now let's introduce trig functions. Cosine three theta over two plus i sine three theta over two. And we got an i uh, as a coefficient. So the i will go on the cosine function. We'd have an i squared on the sine function when distributing and using Cauchy's formula. So we get an i here and a negative here when we deal with the distribution. And we're still taking theta to be between zero and pi. So we're good to go. Here's the integrand uh, written. Here's the integrand written in terms of real and imaginary parts. And that's how we evaluate integrals of a complex function. So when we integrate around c, c to the one half dz, We'll integrate from zero to pi with a concern about the zero to be dealt with shortly. F of z of theta, z prime of theta, d theta, that's the very definition of that type of integral. Okay, we just saw uh, f of z of theta, z prime of theta can be written as given up here. So we'll just copy that down, uh, break it into two integrals, both of them real but break it up over the imaginary i there. So we'll have i times this integral uh, minus the integral of the, the real part, if you like. Okay. Um, ooh, now at some point I got to deal with the fact that that integrand we started with isn't defined at theta equals zero. Theta is not allowed to be zero in the, the setting it came to us because of the branch of the logarithm we're using. Now you might observe yourself, self, uh, I got no problems with theta equals zero in this stuff because I got sines and cosines. The problem with theta being zero comes from upstairs. Theta wasn't allowed to be zero because of the branch of the logarithm we're using. It'll all come out in the wash, so it becomes a fairly undramatic story, but that's the logic of where we find ourselves at this stage. So we'll have to rewrite these improper integrals as a limit, say as the lower bound A approaches zero from the positive side in both cases. Uh, the branch of the logarithm is defined for any angle slightly bigger than zero. So we'll write it as these one-sided limits as you would do in calculus two when dealing with improper integrals. This is a calculus two improper integral because everything that we're dealing with integration wise is real and these integrands are not defined at theta equals zero, right? Right, theta equals zero was disallowed. These particular functions are, but the integrand doesn't let you use these particular functions in the representation of that log. All right, so we'll integrate uh, straightforward integral with respect to theta so let's see, um, carry this uh, antiderivative of cosine theta, I'm sorry, cosine three theta over two, is sine three theta over two, have to divide by three halves or multiply by two thirds. Two thirds, the threes will cancel, we'll pick up a two there, the integration's correct. Over here, similarly, we'll integrate uh, antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, so pick up a positive out front. And we need to evaluate that from a to pi and then evaluate the limit. So we'll plug in the pi, we'll plug in the a, 
we'll take the limit, skip the step where the limit's actually evaluated. And ultimately we have plugged in A equals zero because these functions, these sines and cosines, they are continuous at zero, they're continuous everywhere. So as predicted, gee, that's kind of undramatic after all that stuff with limits. Um, you know, we could avoid it all of this if we'd used a different branch of the logarithm that didn't cut contour C. But with the cut, this is the correct way to do it. Uh, things simplify upon evaluating the trig functions to apparently negative two square root of three I plus one. Oh, okay. Um, some comments. This is more along the lines of how Fraley and Beauregard deal with this the way We've dealt with it as a little bit better, uh, but they're going to appeal to piecewise continuity uh, and say, yeah, we could have just uh, overlooked that fact that that integrand is undefined at a single point. Granted, single points don't affect the values of integrals. So this, the following argument is correct. My way is better, uh, at least initially we will kind of succumb to their way because taking these one-sided limits all the time might get fairly tedious. And this argument's correct, which we're about to present. Uh, the non-existence of the integrand at z equals three, you know, it disappeared when we took the limit. Um, that's because we had a totally legitimate antiderivative that could be extended to theta equals zero. The reason we couldn't use the zero was because of the branch of the square root, uh, square root of z, z to the one half. The branch that we used disallowed us having a function defined at z equals three, having a function defined where theta equals zero. That branch of the logarithm on which this branch of the square root is based didn't allow theta equals zero. Uh, but we do have f piecewise continuous on C. The only place we had a problem was at the end point. And we saw that in, I think, the previous section where we had contours that join at a sharp point. And we just took integrals up to that point uh, and then switched over to the other contour. We can explain this away by talking about piecewise continuity or by saying, hey, you know, we could have taken that function to take on this value at three, and this was what we would have gotten out of the limit, limit had we dealt with the limit more hands-on for the function itself. Uh, okay, then that would be redefining the integrand at a single point, and that doesn't change values of integrals. I mean, the area under a point zero, if you want an area interpretation of integrals, and that is absolutely correct, uh, barring some, some negative signs in the real setting. And the integrals we're dealing with they start in a complex setting, but we change them into integrals in the real setting. So this is a legitimate argument. Integrals aren't affected by changing a single, the value of the integrand at a single point. So this integral wouldn't be changed either. Uh, more quickly, uh, Brown and Churchill explain it as, We'll integrate, we'll find an antiderivative and plug in the values of the antiderivative. And I think this is what they present in the book in their example. Yeah, okay, there's model, there's a fair amount of details that allows you to take that zero and plug it in. They're cleanly explained with one-sided limits. They're more quickly and also accurately explained by redefining the integrand at a single point. That won't affect values of integrals. It allows you to avoid the one-sided limit stuff. I'm liking the one-sided limit stuff. If I'm gonna do this rigorously, we're gonna deal with the one-sided limit stuff. Tedious though it is, uh, but that is a more clean way to, to approach it. All right, well, let's take a look at this one. We're gonna have the same type of problem. Uh, maybe I will we'll wave my hands through some of this uh, in terms of redefining the function. All right, so this time we're looking at C as a positively oriented circle, Z equals R E to the I theta, circle centered at the origin with radius R. Here's what we're up against there. Um, see, this particular figure actually has R equals to one, what we've done. Um, we're dealing with a more general case where R need not be one when we go through and evaluate the integrals. 
So actually that figure doesn't quite jive with the, cl the claim here, unless we make this negative R. Uh, but this is good enough in terms of a figure. Um, certainly we take R to be positive. Uh, so let's see, we'll take A to be uh, any non-zero real number. And we're looking at a branch of Z to the A minus one. All right. So we're taking a complex number, raising it to a power. Unless that exponent is uh, an integer or a rational number, this requires, well, in the complex setting, even in the rat with the rational numbers, in the complex setting, this requires definitely the branch stuff. If that exponent is an integer, we're good to go. In the complex setting, anything else, even rational numbers are going to involve roots of some sort, and roots of some sort involve branches of the logarithm. So this has got to be dealt with in terms of uh, some logarithms. Uh, A is not necessarily just an integer. So uh, by definition, f of z is z to the a minus 1, e to the a minus 1, principal branch of the logarithm. So that's the branch of z minus a, the branch of the function z minus a that they've chosen is the principal branch of that function. Requiring z not be 0, we can never have zeros in this stuff because of the logs. And that the argument be between negative pi and pi. When we dealt with the principal value of the logarithm, or the principal branch of the logarithm, we took arguments between negative pi and pi. Remember, the branch cut looked like this, and I was so disappointed that the principal branch of the logarithm isn't defined for negative real numbers. So we can't take logarithms of negative real numbers, well, not with a principal branch of the logarithm, but there's other branches with which we can. I've mentioned it's common for the, in other settings and other textbooks to take logarithms and cut it along the negative imaginary axis. I mean, that comes with the benefit of having logs of negative real numbers defined. But here's what we're faced with. So we want to evaluate uh, the integral about C for Z to the A minus one DZ. And we got that problem that that integrand isn't defined at negative one. All right, so we're gonna redefine the integrand. This is gonna look a little weird. We're gonna redefine it. It ends up, we'll redefine it at two points. And there'll be the endpoints, negative pi and pi. When we set up the integral, we'll have negative pi and pi as endpoints of the integral. So we're gonna bury that discontinuity uh, or the fact that that integrand is not defined, uh, by redefining the function at the endpoints, it'll involve trig functions and we'll be okay. Okay, so we need um, f of z of theta, z prime of theta, like always. Uh, z of theta was our e to the i theta, so we'll raise that to the a minus one power. z prime would be this times i, so pick up an i by the chain rule. Uh, collecting together using all the stuff we know about adding exponents. We're good on that stuff. We'll have r to the a minus one times r, gives r to the a. We've got an i from this expression. We've got e to the a minus one times i theta, e to the i theta. Multiply those together, add exponents. That'll leave us with an e to the i a theta. All right, let's bust that into real and imaginary part is actually similar to the previous one. We'll use Cauchy's formula to get cosine a theta and i sine a theta, but there's an i out front. So take this i, distribute it through Cauchy's formula. It'll produce this, including a negative sign here in front of the, uh, the sine function. So there's the integrand. All right, so we'll take that integrand uh, it's continuous except at the endpoints, negative pi and pi, the endpoints of the interval theta. So we do have piecewise continuity on a closed interval. Uh, what we'll do is, well, we're going to redefine um, things at negative theta. I'm sorry, at theta equals negative pi and theta equals pi. Alternatively, we can take one-sided limits. I actually prefer the one-sided limits, though. Uh, but Brown and Churchill will approach it like this. So I'm illustrating their approach, even though that would be cleaner if we did one-sided limit things. 
we'll end up with the same answer at least. Okay, so some brevity, I guess, is worthwhile. The integral in terms of thetas becomes this. We saw above uh, that yields um, this particular value for the integrands. We've done that substitution here, brought the uh, IR, I R to the A power out. That leaves us with the um, exponential part, which we could break into real and imaginary parts, but we've buried a lot of stuff here. Uh, all we need is an antiderivative. Well, it's easy enough to anti-differentiate exponential functions, even in the complex setting. Uh, sure enough, we'll get e to the i a theta divided by i a, take a derivative, chain rule will give you an i a out that will cancel, and we'll get back where we started. That's a legitimate antiderivative. We need to evaluate that from negative pi to pi, or if I had my way, we'd take some one-sided limits. Um, in the end, because this is a continuous function, I, that's continuous everywhere, exponential functions, uh, we would get out on evaluating those limits. We'd get the same thing out. e to the i a pi minus e to the negative i a pi, that would be uh, the imaginary part of uh, e to the i a pi. We've taken this, subtracted its conjugate, if we were divide by, to divide by 2i, we'd get the imaginary part. Well, we didn't divide by 2i, then we get 2i times the imaginary part. The imaginary part of this is sine a pi. So the 2i comes from, look back at the early stuff we did when we found imaginary parts of complex numbers using conjugates, probably in the section on conjugates. So we pick up a factor of 2i and we get the imaginary part, sine a pi out, and that's the value of the integral. Uh, this holds for all non-zero, real a. Uh, some observations, if a is a non-zero integer, then we'd be looking at, um, so we'll say a equals n plus one is an integer. Um, then we'd be looking at uh, r to the n plus one over n plus one, this idea that we've added one to the exponents, the reason for the choice there. Uh, we get uh, to i sine n plus one pi. Hey, if uh, n's an integer, this is an integer multiple of pi, we'll get zero out. Uh, it was an integral around a simple closed contour, and I've predicted that we'd get zeros out for those integrals lots of the time. Uh, Churchill and uh, Brown and Churchill say, if A is allowed to be zero, then we'd get this out uh, and we'd be integrating the one over Z function. Uh, that's true to be explored later. If we integrate the one over Z function around the unit circle or any circle containing zero, we're going to get two pi i out. But I, I can't extract that out of this. This this computation doesn't show that. We can't let A equal zero. The stuff upstairs totally dissolves if we try to let A equal zero. Uh, we need a different computation to establish that. We'll be seeing lots of these integrals that turn out to be two pi i's. Must, must have something to do with arguments, right? Because you're used to this two pi i deal popping up with arguments quite often. So that'll take care of that section and we'll move on to the next section. If I can get us stopped, I'll catch you later.